Thank you for joining us for today's accredited e-consult webinar series. Uh, Dr. Lawrence Hookie, who's the division chair in gastroenterology here at Queen's University is joining us this morning. Uh, he's also the medical director for endoscopy uh, at KGH and Hotel Dew. So we're in really good hands this morning to lead our discussion in e-consult and how, how that relates to the specialty of gastroenterology. So welcome, Dr. Hookie, and thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, invitation. I'm, um, uh, I just had to mute myself for an overhead page, but I'm gonna share my screen now. Hopefully that will work. Great. So, everybody can see that? Okay, perfect. Yes. I see some familiar faces uh, in the audience already. Um, uh, so welcome. So today we're gonna talk about GI and sort of the triage pathway that we have and then where e-consult fits now and where we see it fitting in the future. And I'm certainly open for feedback um, and ideas about where we can go next with things. So I don't wanna rush through the disclosures. I think people sort of skip over these things, but really I don't have much in the way of disclosures when it comes to uh, conflicts here. I'm doing research and have consulting fees with Endofarm, who's a bowel prep uh, uh, company. So we're hoping to identify three relevant e-consult opportunities by the end of this session, talk about how to integrate e-consult into the practice of primary care providers and how we're gonna collaboratively manage patients uh, through e-consult as well, and possibly in combination with other tools. So what are your pathways to see a GI specialist in Kingston at least? Um, and just to note, our referral base or our refer referrals have gone up. So um, I think two years ago, we were getting 5,500 referrals, which is a lot for a group of 10, I think. Um, we've grown to 11, and now we're getting uh, over 7,000 referrals a year. So we haven't increased our capacity to see those patients uh, in any meaningful way. So we're trying to find ways to help provide care for those patients without um, without having increased capacity. We can't have another 20 clinics here. And the other problem is when we see more patients in clinic, GI is a, an investigator, especially a lot of the time as well. So the endoscopy actually requires, uh, or endoscopy also often follows the uh, consult. So there's an, another bottleneck uh, at that point. However, we see patients as inpatients. Uh, obviously our inpatient consult service, I think is one of the busier ones uh, within the internal medicine groups. Uh, fax referrals, we're still seeing faxes. We're talking about ocean and maybe at another forum, but we're talking about whether ocean would work. And I hear different things from the ocean fans on this side of, uh, of things and the ocean uh, skeptics on the primary care side of things. So I think that would be another interesting discussion uh, to have with our primary care partners. E-consults, I'll go a little bit further into how, how we deal with e-consults right now. And then our clinical care pathways, which is an exciting project that Dr. Melissa Kelly has been leading. And we've been doing that for the last couple of years and it's finally sort of coming to, it's uh, hitting the rubber's hitting the road now. So how do e-consults work with that is one of our questions as well. So how long does a patient wait to see us? And I think that's um, something everybody has some idea about and whether or not they know or not. Uh, there's a lot of ideas of, well, if we get this patient scoped in Napanee or Belleville, it'll help you because you won't have to wait for that aspect of things. That's usually not uh, entirely true. Uh, and there are usually problems with that type of strategy, uh, but I understand the, the thinking behind it. When we get a fax referral, if it's an emergency, then we'll re-refer them or defer them to the emergency room. But we get a fax referral for an urgent or an elective uh, care case. Then we get folders every, uh, I think twice a week, we get folders with uh, multiple referrals and we triage them. And the triage either goes to the general GI clinic and the current wait time for that is 18 months. That's actually be coming down a little bit during the pandemic, even though we hadn't, um, we didn't stop seeing any patients in clinic and we didn't stop seeing any change in volume. In fact, we saw a little bit more. Our wait times went up a little bit because referrals bumped up again. 
but now we're, we're back down around 18 months, which is hardly a, a happy place, um, but we're trying to uh, keep working that down. We do have a rapid access clinic and the wait time for that is three to four weeks. We don't have someone, we don't have a clinic where someone can be seen within two or three days after being seen in an emergency room. But we do have a little bit of leeway with that where if we get that call from the emergency room, we can go and see them, uh, arrange to see them in clinic. But oftentimes we just prefer to see them when they're in eMERGE. We do have a cancellation list variable, which is sort of our um, compromise. So if we have, someone who's been referred may think, well, they don't need to go to urgent clinic, but we don't want to wait 18 months. We can wait six months or four months and have them seen uh, in that period of time. And then when a cancellation comes up for a clinic, our uh, secretary uh, books, uh, books them. Of our team of admin, admin team, we have two full-time secretaries whose only job is to book clinic appointments and to deal with the triage. And in fact, we've added a, a half-time person for that as well for, for liver specifically. We do have uh, specialty clinics. We have liver, we have two or three liver clinics uh, a week. In fact, they're double clinics. So we have six liver clinics a week. We have motility clinic dealing with both upper and lower GI motility issues. And we have inflammatory bowel disease uh, clinic, which would deal with, we, we deal with a lot of inflammatory bowel disease until they get to a biologic. We as in the general GI group. And then when you get into people requiring biologics, all our biologic uh, all patients requiring biologics are taken care of in the specialty clinic. Sometimes we get a referral, and if it's for someone who's relatively healthy, who has iron deficiency anemia, we'll triage them direct to procedure. If it's dysphagia and odynophagia and someone who doesn't have a lot of comorbidities, we'll triage them direct to procedure. Rectal bleeding in young people go direct to the flexible sigmoidoscopy. If someone has stones seen on ERCP or MRCP and they need ERCP, we, direct, we triage them direct to ERCP. When we triage people directly to these procedures, we usually either phone them if it's early, uh, or sorry, if it's urgent, we need to do it within a week or so, we'll phone them and give them a heads up of what the procedure is about. So there's a bit of pre-consent prior to showing up uh, prepped or showing up to a procedure. And if it's uh, longer out, we actually send a letter with a consent form and they have to sign it and send it back to us before we'll bring them in direct to the procedure. So two of our division members are, have been e-consultants since the rollout of uh, e-consult. Uh, Danielle might be able to tell us how long that's been, but they've been doing it now for a few years, I think. So Dr. Catherine Lowe's on the left, if you didn't guess, uh, and she, my left at least, she is uh, a hepatologist, general uh, gastroenterologist. So she deals with Gen GI questions, but she tackles most of the uh, liver ones as well. And Robert Bashera is more of a general uh, gastroenterologist who also does therapeutic endoscopy. He's my therapeutic endoscopy partner. So he uh, deals with more of the general GI, um, but they, they deal with them largely as they, as they come in. Patients we don't really want to see an e-consult or have fax referrals, obviously acute GI bleeds. There's always a question of whether someone has Molina or not, and they've had Molina every day for 30 days, but it probably isn't Molina, but uh, th that's one of the things. Acute biliary obstruction, that usually is good for a phone call or uh, if they have fever, can go direct to the emergency room. Severe abdominal pain, we usually can't see those patients within a day or two, so going through the emergency room is the right place for them. Acute liver decompensation, again, they usually require hospitalization anyway, similar to a severe IVD flare. And the acute pancreatitis, and people with an acute esophageal obstruction, like a food bolus obstruction, we don't really want to scope them as outpatients. We want to scope them in the emergency room where we have our full uh, inpatient team available and the backup in case they require admission or airway management. Our typical urgent clinic access uh, our dramatic change in uh, bowel habits, so they're completely uh, constipated, or more often new onset severe diarrhea. Uh, usually, we, if someone has diarrhea for three or four days and we get that consult, I'll usually wait it out and wait a, a week or two uh, and see if things settle down. But it's usually infectious. Significant weight loss. We see our fair share of weight loss patients, as you'd expect, but a lot of times it's not purely GI related. And as I teach uh, our residents and med students, the constitutional symptoms that we all learned about in medical school with respect to cancer-related symptoms are pretty rare for most GI cancers. 
You get them a little bit with pancreatic cancer, but normally with colon cancer, you don't get constitutional symptoms unless they're actually severely anemic or they're, they have metastatic disease. Iron deficiency anemia, and we've had some discussions within our hospital and within our teams about this, because there is a, we're doing a clinical care pathway with the general internal medicine group for anemia, and particularly iron deficiency. And the biggest thing we go back and forth on, and this might be worthwhile for an e-consult, but the biggest thing we go back and forth on when it comes to people referred for iron deficiency anemia is trying to prove that it's actually iron deficiency. So we get a lot of borderline blood work results. We get a lot of normal MCVs and, and mild anemias. And those ones, really, if it's proven iron deficiency, once you prove it, we're all in. We don't want to see if they respond to iron or not. We don't care about that. If it's iron deficiency and they're over 40 or they're male, over 40 woman or male, then we're very interested in those patients and we'll see them in urgent clinic. Those are a high priority patient for us and we'll see them. If it's borderline iron deficiency or if they're not, you know, they're blood donors and stuff like that, that's a little bit different. But the patients who have a mixed picture or have been put on iron and then it's hard to interpret their uh, iron results. Um, so a response to iron is not part of our algorithm at all. Um, and we'll, if you have proven iron deficiency, particularly in a higher risk individual, postmenopausal woman or a man, particularly over 40, we see them uh, rapidly and we'll do an endoscopic evaluation. Our main fear or concern being colon cancer, uh, but celiac disease is way up there as a, as a possible etiology as well. Rectal bleeding, if we don't think they're well enough to go direct to procedure, if there's some other part of the puzzle we want to figure out, we'll see them in urgent clinic. Dysphagia patients get seen in urgent clinic uh, quickly. Our fit patients who we're not quite sure are fit for are fit for colonoscopy, then we'll bring them into urgent clinic as well. And if something shows up on CT done for other reasons, like a thickened uh, stomach, thickened esophagus, or some colonic findings, we'll either go direct to procedure or bring them into clinic for assessment. <clears throat> so I asked my colleagues about the last. Uh, 10 e-consults that each of them saw. And it was sort of a mix of cases, liver test abnormalities. I think that lends itself well to e-consults actually, because you can sort of determine what sort of evaluation you want to do next and next steps. Chest pain, whether it's cardiac or reflux related, we're actually developing a reflux, or we just released a reflux related uh, pathway. So I'll come back to that. Uh, but the chest pain is a little bit more challenging, particularly to deal with uh, through e-consults diarrhea assessment, celiac assessment, and the, the thing that we get a lot in celiac disease assessment, the patients have been on, off gluten for years and they feel well, but they're curious about whether or not they truly have celiac disease. And those are sort of questions we can deal with over uh, e-consult for sure. Constipation uh, assessment, dyspepsia, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, rectal bleeding, that's not really something that's very e-consult uh, uh, amenable, I don't think. No, and weight loss and vomiting is something we'd much rather see in person as well. So, you know, I've been challenged by the, the team here to try to figure out the best e-consult uh, GI cases. And, uh, and I think we're still trying to figure out the answer to that, particularly when we're having these pathways uh, rolling out as well. But I think liver test interpretation and further workup, that, that lends itself fairly well to e-consult. Anemia workup, I think helping people sort of guide through that uh, and how to actually prove the iron deficiency or to evaluate it uh, further. But like I say, once you have iron deficiency, we don't care if they respond or not, we'll, we'll see them and, and scope them. Um, and then after we scope them, you know, that's another question, or another series, but after we do the endoscopy, if everything's normal, then we might do some small valve evaluation, but we also have further guidance on, on therapy then too. I think another thing that hasn't come up uh, really, but we sort of deal with uh, by fax questions as well, because the surveillance has changed with respect to colonoscopy and polyps and the guidance has changed the more we know about things. So low risk adenomas are now being sent back to average risk pathways, particularly with FIT being such a good uh, test. So we're dealing with questions with respect to that as well. And then an opportunity I think is dealing with questions about uh, the clinical pathways. So the clinical care pathways were inspired by the University of Calgary GI division. Uh, and we actually had Dr. Mark Swain, who was their division chair at the time, 
uh, come out here right before the pandemic, I think a month before the pandemic started. And we did a workshop, uh, Robin Brown, Colin Wilson and Veronica Lagnini came and um, and we had we had some other primary care partners as well. Those are the ones who sort of stuck with us and, and we kept going with things. Um, and we we sat in a in a hotel boardroom for two or three hours and talked about how this would possibly look for us and what were the topics and, and conditions that we work well with. And we worked through them since. And we thought, oh, within three months, the pandemic came within three months, we'd bang this out. And here we are two years later, but they're actually now now rolling out. So we rolled out dyspepsia, which I think is a very common uh, issue, reflux disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver. We have pathways for diarrhea, constipation, and irritable bowel, and they're all going to roll out uh, soon as well. And the joy of the role or of the pathways is that they give fairly clear, I think, discrete um, guidance for the family doctor to go through the symptoms and what to do next, or what we suggest we do next. And the other thing that came from family doctors in Calgary is they really like this as well. So they can show a patient where they are on the pathway and what the next steps would be. And there's an out, you may not see this uh, as well here, but there are outs to either direct to procedure. If there's an issue, then they go direct to procedure. If they have another symptom, you jump over to the dyspepsia pathway. Or if there's a concern or a more urgent concern, then we'll see them uh, more urgently uh, and refer for consult down here. So with the path, if someone's gone through the pathway and then there's an out, to having to see us and we have a flag for that and we'll see them uh, more urgently. They're not waiting the 18 months at that point. This is the direct procedure where we have this path, this part of the pathway, they might require endoscopy, um, but they may not get a full, you know, uh, I guess it's part of the pathway. So they'll come in, they'll get the endoscopy in relatively short time. Um, and then they, depending on our findings, they might jump back into the pathway and back with their family doctor for further uh, care that way. So right now we have a dedicated pager. I think uh, doctors and drug dealers are the only ones still using pagers, although I hear drug dealers have dropped them off uh, now as well. So we're the only ones using pagers. We have a dedicated pager just for uh, and myself and Dr. Kelly right now are the only ones using it, but we're just available to answer questions with respect to the pathways. And the pager has been quite quiet, even though we know the pathway has been up, uh, taken up by a number of uh, practices. So I wonder if actually going forward and doing e-consults with a little bit of a less urgent way to answer, ask these questions might be a good way, particularly as we roll out more of these pathways. So I thought that might be an opportunity uh, going forward as well. So I've run a bit over time. I'm sorry, Danielle, um, but uh, hopefully we've covered some useful topics. And I don't know if there's any questions in the um, chat already, or if there's questions from the group. Yeah. So I think we'll just open. Maybe we'll stop sharing the presentation so we can see our participants. Okay. That means I have to do that. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh. Perfect. Thanks very much. So for those that might be new to eConsult, you'll see that Heidi's been posting a lot in the chat around what an eConsult is and how you participate in an eConsult. And if you're interested in registering, how you might learn more. Uh, but I think this is a great time to ask some additional questions for Dr. Hookey. So maybe for those on the call that are joining us, if you just want to uh, uh, unmic yourself, take, mute, you take yourself off mute uh, and let us know what questions that you may have. In the meantime, my question was exactly that, where you finished at the end of the discussion about where eConsult fits within the clinical pathways and how primary care providers learn more about those pathways now, the ones that are already up and running. Yes, so uh, I actually invited Madeline uh, on as well, and she is uh, the Pathways uh, Care Lead working with Elizabeth Eisenhower. So as each of these pathways get uh, launched, they're actually, uh, we have a clinical or CME uh, rollout and Dr. Kelly's uh, uh, led the last two of those. And there's an, a, a participation from the family doctors and there's a co-presenters. So Colin Wilson presented uh, one time and Robin Brown mm. presented the other with, uh, with Melissa. So this really 
you know, what I don't want this to seem like is us pushing care back and saying, we don't want anything to do with this. It really is a side-by-side -side, uh, management for these patients. Right. And that's why we're a little bit disappointed. We're not getting paged uh, for these uh, questions all the time. So I'm trying to think of a good way for us to, uh, to do that. Madeline's with the link in there, but I must say it's very easy to find. I just Googled uh, <clears throat> clinical pathways KHSC uh, last night and it comes right to the link. And as you know, finding things on the KHSC website isn't always easy. So that was actually yeah. uh, uh, an easy navigation. So uh, that worked out, uh, you know, that, that's how, how that is right now. And we're hoping to keep uh, doing other things because, you know, the reality in Calgary is they had a low priority patient uh, classification, say cl classification four. And mm -hmm. those patients, the family doctors being told those patients will be see a year or two down the road, but they just kept getting bumped down. Like our patients, at least if it's general GI, they're getting seen at 18 months. That's nothing to be proud of. I know that, but they're getting seen. It's not like they're category four where they're just constantly getting bumped by the more uh, higher priority patients. So right. there's a way to get these patients cared for while they're waiting and a way for them to get cared for perhaps without needing to see us at all, knowing that this is sort of joint management. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as you said, I mean, Dr. Lowe and Dr. Pacher have been doing e-consults at the beginning. So for us, that was back in 2016 when we started our pilot, which became a program and we're still here today. So interestingly enough, gastroenterology is our fifth most popular e-consult as well. So we're looking at receiving between like 100 and 120 e-consults per year for that specialty in particular. So yeah, it's, it's interesting to know just where it fits and how it then lines up with where you're now moving with your clinical care pathways. Yeah, and I think, you know, I think uh, it's not a sexy specialty, but it's quite a common uh, uh, issue and, con and concern, I think, in internal medicine on the inpatient service, about 30% of the patients have uh, primary uh, GI issues uh, requiring mm. their admission. So uh, it's a high, it's a high volume, uh, um, high, a high priority uh, specialty and, and disease set for sure, and probably because we cover so many different uh, conditions as well. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I know during the discussion, you talked about those popular groups for e-consult, which is really, really helpful. And then also importantly, what doesn't work for e-consult. Are there thoughts about um, prep for a visit to see a specialist? And does that work for gastro? I know it works for some other specialties, but not always, right? So thoughts on where that works for gastro? Well, and I'd like to hear more from the primary care doctors about that as well, because we've, we've gotten, a, we've sort of tried to um, not have them go to e-consult and then say, well, then you got to send in a fax referral and then try to put that work back on the family doctor. And maybe that's not a lot of work. Maybe it's good for them. I, I don't know. I can see through the endocrinology pathway or uh, presentation, that's sort of a bit more of the, the way they do it. When we receive a, um, uh, a fax referral and there's some pieces of the puzzle missing, we just, you know, right on the back of our form and it gets sent back and, and we just wait for that more information to come through. So I, I don't, you know, I think it's possible, but I don't know uh, if that's the best way to deal with this. And, and like I say, the volumes of referrals that we get are, I think we're the second highest specialty, certainly in internal medicine when it comes to volume of referrals. So uh. if we all of a sudden started seeing all those prep patients, you know, prep for visit patients coming through, um, I think that would overwhelm us our ability to deal with this to, or to be a different way of dealing with it. At least. Right, right. I know that uh, Dr. Glad has a question in the chat about any thought of making an ocean form for pathways. Well, Dr. Glad, I'd like to know what you think about ocean. I, I really want to hear you guys tell me about ocean and whether it's good or bad or whether what the, because I've heard people aren't that keen on it and that doesn't communicate directly with your own EMRs. So it doesn't pre-fill the forms and things like that. And I know our, our team, our side of things says, oh, 80% of family practices are ocean compatible. It doesn't mean they're using ocean all the time. So I don't know what the, do you want to sign in, uh, Daniel, and tell me what you think about Sorry, ocean? I, are, you, are you a big fan? I, I, just, I just dropped my kids off at daycare, so I am driving. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, perfect. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, certainly ocean forms are underutilized. We use ocean for key referrals in our practices and uh, quite frequently uh, for like DI and things. Um, I, I think the problem with these pathways is that many providers will know about them now, remember them now, but there's not 
a central, maybe there was a central KHC website for all the pathways, it'd be easier. I just worry in, you know, a year from now that myself or my colleague will forget a pathway exists, right? Um, to refer to if it's on multiple different websites. So um, just trying to consolidate resources all in one place um, might increase uptake of pathways. So Ocean eForms, you know, a KHC pathway that you just type it in and all the eForms are there. It might make it easy. There might be other ways to do it as well. Yeah, I think that's something we can explore um, uh, perhaps further down the road. Not further down the road, but we are. Let me tell you that we're not against Ocean on our side of it. The hospital team is very keen on it. Um, and I am, from a GI point of view, we're looking at Ocean specifically for liver because I think it works very nicely for some of our liver conditions. So we've just got a new secretary. Once she's up and running and, and has a good feel for things, we're thinking about rolling out Ocean for all liver related referrals. With respect to having the pathways all in one place, I think they are now at, uh, at the KHSC website, but also the joy of them from, from what I hear is that a lot of our family doctors will download them into their EMR and then have them available as their own repository uh, on, on their website. Oh, interesting. Just as it relates to the e-referral tool, they're actually going to be rolling out um, a function within that Ocean e-referral tool that allows for e-consult moving forward. And if you were to receive an e-referral, uh, Dr. Hookie, you'd be able to potentially turn that into an e-consult if you thought that it was an effective response to the wow. e-referral. So I think it's gonna create a much um, better exchange system. Uh, of information between primary care and specialty care. Uh, we're hearing that that functionality might be rolling out later this spring. And Alex Russell, who's just got his hand up, is actually a member of the e-referral team. Alex. Okay. Good morning. Thank you, Danielle. Um, I won't dive too much into the referral side. Um, one thing I'll, I'll note too is, uh, yes, uh, lots of pathways and, and more coming on, which is fantastic um, across the province. It's rolling now uh, across not just in the southeast in Champlain, where it's expanding in now into Central East and Toronto and Toronto Central as well. Um, so there's a lot of advantages there. Um, but uh, on the piece noted around um, remembering, um, there is some options too. Um, if you'd like to reach out to us, we, we can certainly help where you can save site favorites, but you can also group them by specialty um, in your ocean as well from primary care. So that once you've sent to somebody um, on the system, um, it's saved in your site favorites, it's there. You can group them by gastro and cardio, um, so it's easy to find. But you can also use the directory as well within the Ocean Health Map to find specialties very quite quickly, or you can, there's a number of different options for searching or searching for a specific doctor or specialty group um, as well. So we're always here to support. So if you, at any time you'd like to reach out, I'll put my, my email um, in the chat and we're more than happy to, to follow up with you and, and find ways to uh, have the system best suit you. Yeah, and I think to, um, to both Daniel's and, and Alex's point, we're going to help you remember pathways uh, because if you refer a patient to us who fits well in a pathway, we actually have a letter that we're sending back saying, can you please consider presenting this patient or dealing with this issue through the pathway and let us know when they actually have to jump out of it. And we'll send a link to the pathway as part of that uh, letter back as well. Um, so that's going to be, you know, if they don't fit it or you don't feel comfortable with it, then we're going to talk back and forth about that then too. So Great. So I'm just conscious of time. Madeline, maybe a quick comment. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that where there are specialties that are accepting e-referrals through OCEAN, we have allowed for pathways to be kind of identified there. So just as a reminder, like if you were referring, for example, anemia is uh, going to be launched this spring. So if you were referring for anemia, there's a little reminder there saying, did you know there's a pathway for this condition? And it links you to the pathway. So definitely trying to integrate um, everything together where possible. Lovely. So there's a lot happening with respect to the use of digital tools in gastroenterology, which is very exciting, you know, whether it's uh, clinical pathways, e-referral, e-consult. So I think there's a, a lot moving on in that space. 
Uh, so thanks very much for joining us this morning and uh, telling us what's happening with gastroenterology. We look forward to working with you and learning more in the coming days and weeks ahead. Thank you everybody for signing on. Thank you, Danielle and the team for uh, organizing this, Agula for putting up with me and my missed deadlines. Uh, so have Great. a good day, have a good weekend. All right, so thanks everyone for joining us on the call this morning. Uh, as you'll notice, our next session is up on April the 8th and we'll be talking to uh, David Lee in hematology. Look forward to seeing you back then. Take care.